SBCC Scheinfeld Center New Venture Challenge. Creative ideas and hardworking students show us all what it means to dream, plan, and profit. College and high school students across Santa Barbara County have tuned their business plans, researched the competition, developed prototypes, found customers, and sharpened their pitches. It's time to find out which innovative ideas will win. Past finalists include Fuelbox founders Robert Herr and Dan Friedman, who turned their new venture pitch into a smash hit at the 2017 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Sylvia Franco Comer is the inspiration behind Casa de Comer Salsa, a winner in the 2017 New Venture Challenge. Sylvia launched her flagship Smokin' Good Salsa brand at legendary local fresh food retailer Tri-County Produce. Support your favorite student entrepreneurs at the Scheinfeld New Venture Challenge Competition. Welcome. Welcome to the ninth annual New Venture Challenge Business Plan and Pitch Competition. <laughs> My name is Julie Sampson. I serve as the director of the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Santa Barbara City College. We are a hub of, uh, uh, for the development of entrepreneurs um, at SBC, SBCC and in the community. We focus on the development of globally competent entrepreneurs. And uh, what we have going on today, as you are well aware, is that we have 10 teams who were selected as finalists based on their business plan submissions. And today they will present to you their most persuasive pitch about why their ventures uh, promise success and they're doing this in the pursuit of uh, cash and awards um, and scholarship opportunities. So today, we are very fortunate to have teams from Santa Barbara City College and also Antioch University. And they have worked very long and hard to be here today. And to start off, we would just like all of you to stand up and let's give these folks a hand. Yeah, go ahead and stand up, yeah. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And, you know, these students uh, wouldn't be here presenting today without all of the support of faculty members, our dean of the business department, our department chair, other mentors and uh, friends. So if you have supported entrepreneurs here, could you stand up too? We would like to honor you. Oh, I'm the only one? <laughs> the unseen heroes here. <laughs> so the uh, $15,000 in cash awards and scholarships going to the winners today are generously donated by the Spirit of Entrepreneurship Program, which is part of Women's Economic Ventures. And also uh, contributing is the SBCC Foundation, Montecito Bank and Trust, Southern California, California Edison, Nicholson and Schwartz, CPAs, and the Bank of the West. Uh, this funding opportunity wouldn't be here if it weren't for these sponsors. So thank you so much. Let's give our sponsors a hand. Okay, additionally, we have something that we're adding to our program here at Santa Barbara City College that's a nice follow-on to the winners of uh, the New Venture Challenge, um, those who are from Santa Barbara City College, we are launching this year our Get Real Accelerator. What this is is winners from this competition today at the, co at the college level, as well as from a couple years back, are eligible to participate in the Accelerator. It'll launch in May 2019, and the six-month program is designed to deliver, to deliver customized startup support 
to help these students better navigate startup challenges and close gaps in their own entrepreneurial skill set for success. Up to six teams will participate, and those who achieve their six-month milestones will be eligible to participate in our Get Real Shark Tank competition. That's going to happen on November 1st, and that's during National Entrepreneurship Month. And uh, angel investors will be the judging panel. And we already have $10,000 generously donated from the Santa Barbara City College Foundation. That money will go to one of those teams. But an interesting twist here is if those angel investors want to take up any team on their, uh, their offer for investment, they may decide to do that. So it'll be a fun thing to, to be here on November 1st to take part in that. And uh, the, the um, public, you're invited to attend. And also, uh, during the summer, when they're going through the accelerator, we will be um, posting on our social media, tracking their process, so you can stay apprised of your favorite team and how things are going with them and um, be here to cheer them on on November 1st. So uh, we already have three teams that are identified for this uh, Get Real Accelerator. They are winners from the past New Venture Challenge. And the first one that I would like to tell you about is Jake Zander. Um, these three that I'm going to tell you about, they're here today. So he was the first place winner last year, and just to demonstrate his savvy as an entrepreneur, he just brought to market his insoles that are specifically designed to make your Chuck Taylors oh so comfortable. And he has the goal of selling to you 50 pairs today, and he's going to be out there on the patio afterwards. I think I've heard $14.99 a pair. So if you're a Chuck Taylor fan and you've been, your feet have been dogging it for years, it's time to change that. <laughs> we are also very fortunate to have Sylvia or uh, Heather Lucart, um, who uh, won in 2018. She was our second place New Venture Challenge winner. Um, and she is joining the Get Real Accelerator to advance her innovative flagship project, uh, product, which is the Falcon Travel Bag that allows travelers to rest comfortably on the go while also keeping their valuables secure. And if you're into travel, you'll want this bag. And then the other team that will be joining the Accelerator is Sylvia franco Comer, who placed second in our uh, 2017 New Venture Challenge with her smoking Good Salsa. And uh, it is, let me tell you, you've, we've all had salsa, but I, truly this is the best salsa on the planet. And she was so kind to have some sampling out there during the break. So you'll definitely want to give that a try. And you'll find out where you can purchase that here in town. So to each and every one of our finalists, we wish you success today. And this event is really just the beginning of even greater things to come. And while only three teams will walk away uh, with an award today, everybody goes home richer in the spirit of entrepreneurship. So to everyone here, please join me in creating a positive, supportive, distraction-free, competitive environment for these te teams to shine. Another important part of this is we have our judges here, and we have also the people who are helping. And uh, these are all the businesses that they represent. And this, they are volunteering their time today. And so um, I would really appreciate it if you could uh, show them some gratitude. And why don't we just give them a hand right now and say thank you. <laughs> Okay, great, and now let's get into the nitty gritty of who is actually here. I'm so excited about this panel. Uh, the extended bios of these judges is in your program, so I'm not gonna read that word for word. Let me briefly introduce you to them and we'll give them a warm welcome collectively after I've introduced all of them. So to start off, I would like to introduce Krista Trade, who has spent her career building and leading successful 
category creating brands in hyper competitive global environments. She's held key roles for Nike, Reebok, Diesel, Seven for All Mankind, UGG, Australia, uh, Michael Starr, Speedo, and others. She, holds the, she upholds the capacity to merge commerce and social good and recognizes the, uh, the value of mentorship in entrepreneurial development. We also have Travis Mack, who is a US Navy veteran and CEO of Salix Solutions Incorporated. That's an engineering and information technology services company that he founded in 1999 and has since raised it to employ a workforce of over 600 at military and NASA installations nationwide. He is living proof of the fact that being a military veteran is a factor highly correlated with business success. In fact, he does over $80 million annually. Finally, we have Mike Su, who leads Yellow, which is Snapchat's accelerator program, investing in and helping to build creative content companies. He has held several leading roles in other digital media companies and upholds the value of entrepreneurship in impacting one's thinking to change our thoughts, see greater possibilities, and get things done. He sees tra the tra this transformative transformational nature of entrepreneurship in his role as board member at Defy Ventures, which is a prison entrepreneurship program. Let's give all of these judges a warm hand. Okay, awesome, now let's get this show on the road. So we're gonna run a really tight ship here and uh, I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna work. I'm sure to keep us all on track, each team has eight minutes to pitch. When the buzzer sounds, you are able to finish the non-run-on sentence that you are stating. <laughs> and then we will immediately turn to the judges who have two minutes collectively to just ask questions. That isn't a time for feedback, but rather to clarify things about the pitch and about the business model that they need to understand more clearly to make their assessment of the pitch and the venture itself. Coming up to and leading us off today will be a Baba Connect, but, uh, presented by Dennis Erickson. Hi, my name is Dennis Erickson. This is a Baba App Connect. We connect people with similar interests. Did you know that in Santa Barbara there are about 100,000 students who use the social media? We're gonna change that, we're gonna improve that. So did you know that social media is correlated with an increase in loneliness? Our solution is to bring people together, create new friendships and reduce loneliness by connecting people with similar interests. This is the perfect time to enter this market. There's an with a huge trend in social media, it's a $158 billion industry with a 7% annual growth. This presents an opportunity for investors, but also provides a positive impact on the society. We target market college students in SBCC and UCSB. There are about 40,000 students in these colleges. Just like Facebook, we start with college students, ages, ages 18 to 25. Like me, as an example, I'm an international student you come here and want to find new friends with similar interests. We have a homepage. We have, uh, based on our surveys, night version is the number one interest. So we did a whole page for that. And then there are, uh, this is the most popular interest in Santa Barbara. Just click and show up. It's very easy to use. I will click here just because I like the beach. So I'll click beach, step one, and then it will take me to step two. I will be there. And I can show, uh, and the app shows where it is and how many people are going and, and the bio about it. And step three, just show up. Create your own activity. Uh, when you, uh, we have, we, we're gonna have a membership, so like, just like Meetup, you can host events. And, and step one is just to create a new uh, event. And step two, we select your options. And step three, just to publish it. 
IP and legal will have copyright so far in presentations, flyers, and a unique co computer coding. And we have trademarks, name and logo, and trade secrets, we have a process documentation. And patents, we have a provisional in progress, and business method patent. And 2019 app production timeline. Right now we have uh, done our app in, in Adobe XD, 12 prototypes. We have changed them according to our surveys, how people want them. We have improved them based on the, on the surveys. And in coding, we're coding in React. So we can ha have the app in both iOS and Android. And the beta version release is going to be in September, before the launch in October. When all the new freshmen are coming into Santa Barbara to start school, we're going to have the launch of the app. And hopefully get all of them to have this app. 2019 monetization timeline. In April, we have right now 100 people ready to buy the web survey. And we have a gathering following on social media. And in October, we have a monthly subscription. And hopefully in the future, in 2020, we have a huge database that, um, that we can sell to big companies. Here's our spreadsheet, and I would like to break it down for you. Oh, our competitors, here is, these are our main competitors, and here is the key purchasing criteria. As, and as you can see, Ababa is the only one that fills in all the key purchasing criteria of finding new friends. Our spreadsheet, I would like to break it down for you. Here's the net profit in year number one. We have a tool paying customer of 17,560, and tool units sold is times the sales price, which leaves us with a total revenue of 400 for 2,000. 707, and we have uh, minus that tool expenses, which equals to the net profit, which is $176,097. Sources of funding, we have personal savings, winning from the pitch, winnings from today, and any investor funding. And that leaves us with $266,700. And we have uses of funding, marketing, coding, creating an LLC, and insurance, attorney, and accountant, and unforeseen costs. An exit strategy, we hopefully can sell it to big companies like Facebook or Snapchat or WeWork that just bought up Meetup and that shows that people are willing to buy this uh, similar apps like us. Here's the team. Bjarnar and I are the CEO and co-founders and we have an industry specific mentor, Dylan Carnes, and we have uh, an official consultant, Public Relations, that have helped us to find uh, angel investors and we have an IP mentor, an attorney and the marketing and film photo editing to be able to uh, market that um, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube. And we have Hunter Mayer and Dylan Michael, to, uh, there are two top coders at SBCC. Ababa is a winner. We have a great network, we have annual investors, and we have a strategy, and that will leave us to profitability and hopefully future growth. And we are really passionate about this idea when we came here. We didn't know anyone and we wanted to find new friends so we tried all the social media apps but we couldn't find any app that had that. We wanted to have something in between Facebook and Snapchat and a dating app. And we found out that no one else uses the Bumble or Meetup in our target market. So this is, this is the opportunity to create this app for the target market here. Thank you. Okay, judges. We can wait. You're going to play around with that with that. Uh, uh, you I, have stand there. I have a quick question. Yeah, of course. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so how do you get around the cold start problem? How do you intend, you know, initially when you, when you just get started, there might be three events total in the, how, in the entire area. How are you planning on getting off the ground and having enough density of activity? Can you repeat that question? I like, so one of the problems with social apps in general is, uh, you know, it's like showing up to the, when you're the first person at a party and it's empty. Like, it's not a cool party, right? Yeah. Until people show up. So how do you plan to kickstart the party? Uh, so in the start, uh, the people on our team uh, <laughs> and people we know uh, are going to be at the, each event that are set up to make sure that it goes uh, good. Uh, once we expand, uh, we will probably figure out uh, 
we're, we're looking at uh, what our competitors do, like what Meetup do and what Bumble do, and also with Facebook groups. And uh, we're trying to copy what works, and we're trying to make better, fill the gaps, what doesn't work. Yeah, so this looks great. You guys have done a really nice job. I'm curious, um, beyond just the launch, how do you intend to continually grow your user base? Uh, so, uh, you mean, okay, so do you mean in the first year or in the following? Yeah, I think just ongoing. So in the first year, we're going to grow the user base by uh, social medias and face-to-face -face marketing and also by hosting promotional events. Uh, and we're going to engage a lot of people in the Santa Barbara community uh, to do a lot of fun activities. And uh, in those activities, they will uh, get the chance to download the app and try it for themselves. Yeah, and also I want to add that we are going to start locally here because I think it's a perfect uh, place. It's a lot of students, and we are hopefully going to expand to San Francisco and the big cities too, and, and the East Coast, where we have started and get all the information here. We expand. What is your most important um, need for your business outside of capital? Can I say that again? Yeah, what's, what's your most important need? Um, Outside of capital, oh, it's the team. We we need uh, more more team members and uh, more professional coders. That's probably the need now in the beginning. So we have a great platform and app when we start. And that's work. And that's it. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And next up, please welcome to the stage, Propaya Mixa, with Abel Amos. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abel Amoez, and I'm the CEO and founder of Propia Misha Watery. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm originally from Angola, from the capital Luanda, AKA hell, it's <laughs> chaos. But it's my favorite city in the world. It's the flavors, the people, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, in 2016, we changed presence after 40 years and something wonderful happened. Opportunities for entrepreneurs opened, and many, lots of sectors of the economy are developing, except one that I noticed, and which is the lottery. Illegal lottery shops are opening, so, and I, I noticed something. Why, why isn't there a, a legal lottery? Why isn't there like something like Powerball or Mega Millions, but better in Luanda? And we want to change the game. So how are we going to change it? We're going to create a legal lottery system accessible only to adults. Uh, we're going to leverage the informal, mar uh, the informal market economy, which I'll explain later what it is. We're going to improve local infrastructures by providing taxes to the government. We're also going to offer part-time employment to, to local university students. And we're going to provide a fun and responsible way of betting against the odds and scoring big. The, the, the global lottery market is set to reach $350 billion by 2020. Africa alone spent $3 billion in lottery tickets in 2018. Uh, our target demographics is uh, our, our middle class people between the ages of 27 and 44, because our, our survey suggests that these are the people that are willing to pay because they are the ones that are employed and the ones that are more economically stable. So um, our, our lottery is different because we not only want to target people that want to become millionaires overnight, we also want to target people that want to try it, that want to experience it. This is our device. It's the POS Moonbeam uh, mobile printer. It's a very accessible device. It's an Android-based system. Anybody that has, uh, has used an Android device can use it. We'll explain it to, to, to our vendors. And if you don't, it's very accessible. In 10 minutes, you can learn how to use it. This is our interface. It's very simple. The client approaches the vendor and chooses between a random and a custom set of numbers. In this case, we have a random. He picked five numbers. The vendor prints the ticket, handles it to the client, and that's it. We have a special code, so you can't scam us or anything. And the code goes directly to a server. The, the, the ticket goes to a server, which is, uh, which is uh, secure by Amazon Web Systems. And we also implemented a system that takes a screenshot of the ticket and sends us to a personal Google Drive of the, com uh, Google Drive of the company. After that, um, we announced the results every Sunday 
on Facebook, and then happiness. <laughs> so a uh, sector of the economy, uh, economy is being overseen, and that's the informal market. You guys are not used to your deal in Santa Barbara, I know. Um, so it is the hand-to-hand -hand trade, which is, represents 66 of the 66 percent of the employment in Africa. It's hand-to-hand -hand trades, vending in streets. So, and we also have Africa also has the youngest, uh, largest young adult population in the world, and that's being overseen. It's being wasted. We want to change that. We have to prove to to, to take advantage of this. Our workforce is, is going to be mostly based on the on the large population of university students who are willing to become part-time street vendors at a low cost. Our sales strategy will be very, per very personal and very hand-to-hand. -hand. I'll personally drive the students to, the, to, our, to, six, to three markets where we will sell the tickets, we'll get information for customers, and we'll tell them how to get, how to get access to the results. Our, our, our second phase, which will start um, almost two months after we start selling, will be the options to buy tickets online, which is a, which is a minority, but it's already happening. It's growing, so, and we want to take advantage of that. After that, we want to create fix, uh, three months after adding online sales, we want to create fixed points of sales such as kiosks. And after uh, three months after that, we want to get authorization to sell in shopping malls, which is where the middle class usually hangs out. Um, uh, here are some milestones that include acquiring a business license, contacting social media personalities, booking my flight to China in two weeks to, to check the supply for printers, and completing 650% of the logo. Future milestones including the, uh, in, include winning the Venture Challenge today, guys, like today, <laughs> and gathering 10,000 followers on social media, selling 10,000 tickets, donating $5,000 to organizations uh, initially, and get, uh, get a $75,000 loan. Um, our marketing will be based on social me emerging social media personalities. These are, some of the, these are the, some of the contacts I've made, and some of them I actually made good, really good friendships with. They're willing to uh, promote my lottery, and, and, and in exchange, I'll promote their channels. And we expect a 40% 40% conversion of 100,000 views of, of of their views. Um, these are our. We, I have two competitors. They're mostly based on sports betting, which is not very popular in Angola. But they do offer lottery, but it's not, it's, it, either it's expensive or it's not, uh, it's, the interface is not accessible. And so basically we win in everything. Um, these are our spreadsheet, let me explain this to you. Um, the ticket will be, point, uh, will be 32 cents, which is 150 Kwanzaa, which is our currency. Um, our jackpot will, will, will be $3,143, which represents a million Kwanzaa. This can change, well, we're, we're, we're studying it, we're getting a possibility of getting different prizes. Taxes. 20% for the government, against my will. 40% go to increase the jackpot in case nobody wins. 30% will go for the company, uh, operation expenses and profit. 10% will go special donation, special donation to elementaries and orphanages, especially the Okutuka, uh, Okutuka uh, orphanage. Um, finances, well, we plan to sell, for the first year, we plan to sell 240,000 tickets. Uh, we plan to get 72,000 in revenue. 3,600, 433 in expenses, and we plan to break even in the fourth month, up, covering up to the ninth month. These are our sources of funding, include loan to my mom, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, a potential engine investor, and total 18,000. 18, uh, our user funding for the, for the first month will be, covered, will be used for uh, marketing, uh, ticket printers, legal aid, a trip to China, uh, will also add up to 18,000. 18, our, our legal issues will be assured by Muraj Galvão Leitão. I speak Portuguese, that's why I sound so good. Galvão um, Tales <laughs> Suárez de Lima e Associados, a very good law firm. They accepted to do it for free for the first three months. I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do after that, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> our exit strategy will be to sell to the biggest cable TV company, Zap, mobile company, Unita, which is very big, or get a government contract, which will be, yeah, very nice. Um, my team includes Irina Ferreira, my lawyer, Jairama Moish, my, my sister, me, the CEO and street sales supervisor, and my good friend Miguel Sanchez, software engineer and social media manager. Um, why us? Uh, lawyers usually want to offer millions of dollars. We don't have that. We, were, we, were, we just want to give you a chance to play and get a, a, bit, of a, get a, a bit of money. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, judges' questions. Um, how much security testing have you guys done? I know that's a huge issue in lottery is just, you know, every which way you can hack, people will figure out how to hack yeah. and make money. Uh, so, um, uh, first, uh, first plan, so my, my friend and my partner suggested using Amazon Web Services, which is very hard to hack, a very secure server. But to get that second layer of security, we also added that screenshot of, to send it to ourselves in case somebody hacks into Amazon. I don't know how they do that, but yeah, in case they do that. So we have a double layer of security. And we plan to add more when you develop more. more. Um, great presentation. I, my other question is, have you thought of a different um, sort of investment opportunity than another piece of equipment? Yes, I have. Um, I've, that, one of the reasons I'm going to China is because this equipment costs me $200 a piece in the U.S. And I've, I've talked to my suppliers, and they say they can make me for 30 each. So I'm like, I'm going to China. So I'm going to China and figure it out, talk to them, because it costs me much less the, to, to make one of these. <clears throat> Very good presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, what is the biggest benefit you have gained by developing your business plan in this form? In this form? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what have you learned? What have you gained by going through this process? Through this process? Um, I'm not an, I wasn't an entrepreneur. I, I, I'm still developing my spirit. Um, I'm an engineering major. So for me, it was a, it was a tremendous transition. So I've I've, I've learned that to respect entrepreneurs, it's not easy. It's, it's resilience. It's, um, it's, emotional. it's an emotional weight on you. So you have to be resilient. You have to be passionate about it. And you have to, be, uh, have, to have a little faith on it. That's what I learned. And thank you. And next up. We welcome to the stage People's Pasta, presented by Emily Cascella. Something for you guys to get out of the way. All right, guys. Uh, judges, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Emily Cascella, and I'm really excited and nervous today to bring you my concept, uh, my innovative specialty food concept, People's Pasta. So, our primary research has, show, research has shown that uh, customers in Slow County, especially where we're going to be located, have uh, not an awful lot of choices when it comes to healthy Italian specialties. Um, the target market that we'd like to reach, millennials, lack the skills and the time needed to connect with their food in a meaningful way. And they want to be able to align that with their lifestyle and their ecological values. But their virtual and mobile lifestyles keep them away from the traditional dinner table, which kind of further weakens the very connection that they're seeking. So we bridge the gap between a desire for quick, convenient, healthy comfort food, um, environmental values, and our target market's shortcomings in the kitchen uh, with our flagship line of 100% organic pasta that's sustainably made with solar energy. Um, since basic extruded pasta has just one plant-based ingredient, which is semolina flour, um, it has a small ecological footprint to begin with, and our solar production methods make that even smaller. So this can appeal to our target market who are just as environmentally conscious as they are health conscious and they appreciate the clean label uh, aspects of our products. No ingredients you can't pronounce. Uh, industry highlights include the following. Um, it's a really great time to enter the market. Specialty foods have seen double-digit growth. The industry has revenues of $22 million, billion in the US. Um, and sales of specialty foods have outpaced that of all other food categories. Um, it's due in part to interest in eating healthier foods and things that are sustainably made and an interest in protecting the environment while still filling your belly. 
Uh, our primary research backs this up. 100% um, of respondents preferred specialty foods over commercial brands. In San, Lu San Luis Obispo County, where we're going to be based, nearly 75% of the population is comprised of millennials, our primary target market. Uh, most of them are within a 30-mile radius of our targeted location. And since Americans spend, uh, eat around 20 pounds of pasta per person per year, and our price per pound will be about $6, uh, the potential market size is nearly $25 million. Um, we aim to capture just about 5% of that in our first year and continue to gain market share after that as our reach increases and our marketing takes hold. Uh, customer analysis and target market here. Uh, we're aiming for Slow County. Um, our customers fall into a broad age demographic from college to retirees. Um, incomes vary accordingly. Young, busy families and millennials who aren't kitchen savvy. Airbnbers are a great target market for us. People staying where there is a kitchen and might want to make a dinner for themselves. Um, they're generally environmentally conscious, time conscious, health conscious, socially conscious. Uh, and they'd rather stay in at the end of the day with a bowl of Netflix and noodles than go out. Um, oops, did I skip? Nope. Competitive analysis here. Did I go back? Target markets. Milestones and timeline. Here we go. People's pasta has come a long way since we started. Um, I've had this idea kicking around in my head for quite some time. I started in 2017 with the Weave program. Um, from there, I enrolled in college at a late age. Um, to uh, pursue this. Um, I'm almost 47. So coming back to school was a huge deal. Uh, being in this new venture challenge, huge deal as well. Um, we're looking to uh, launch in the fall of 2020, but beyond that we want to move into a shared commercial kitchen and then expand to our own facility uh, where we can have our uh, retail shop and our uh, production facility as well. So we have had 30 surveys completed to date, and in the key purchasing criteria categories of taste, uniqueness, convenience, price, and image, we've come out on top against our competition in the Cambria, uh, California area. Um, not even the Italian takeout restaurant can do what we're proposing to do here. Our first year revenue goals are going to be, um, oops, uh, regular, sorry, I'm flustered. Um, we'll have all permits and licenses required um, before we before we launch. We're going to be operating at a, as a cottage foods operation type B, which will allow us to sell to wholesale markets, um, and we're going to take it from there. We're researching the non-GMO product qualifications right now, and we'll be trademarking and copywriting our branding material. Go to market plan, I'm going to go over quickly. Our first year revenue goal is $20,000, which represents about 2,500 customers taking into account repeat purchases. Um, phase one, we're gonna utilize Instagram, uh, PR, word of mouth, and generate buzz that way. That'll be starting soon, as, as soon as this semester is over. Uh, phase two, we're gonna engage with the Chamber of Commerce in. Uh, slow as well as Cambria and rely in part on their network and their opportunities for advertising and other perks like that. Um, and phase three uh, will happen when we scale up and at that point I plan on hiring a marketing professional because marketing is not my, my wheelhouse. Um, at startup I'll be doing uh, wholesale and retail distribution myself out of our home office and then later on through food distributors and uh, brokers. Should we have to cease operations, um, I would like to retain the, the building in which we are housed. Uh, we plan on purchasing it. 
and I'm rented out as a, uh, in a, a commercial kitchen and find a tenant. Um, it's a good investment and it just makes sense. Here's our first year financial forecast, which I'll go over for you now. The highlights. Our retail price on basic extruded pasta is $5.99. Uh, and business to business, it will be $4 a pound. Our cost per, uh, uh, cogs per unit is just 66 cents, which gives us some healthy profit margins there. We've got 84, okay, and I'm done. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Hey, great job. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I ran long. No, you did. You did a great job. I think um, you may have tried to capture that at the end, but have gotten cut off. Um, I see this as a huge direct-to-consumer opportunity as well as a, a wholesale opportunity. Mm -hmm. And have you thought about just as you start how much percentage you would you would sort of allocate to each? Uh, not yet. I was thinking probably in the beginning going to you know, customers first um, and then wholesale. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, I think the wholesale market is going to be more profitable um, or a bigger deal, and uh, that is what I need to pursue. We still have B2B research to complete, so that's kind of up in the air, but yeah. Great job. Thank you. How did you decide on these three pasta types to make first? Um, they were quick and convenient to make in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> they are my prototypes. <laughs> Outside of capital, what is your biggest challenge in this space? Oh, gosh. Um, finding a network, connecting with a network. Um, I don't have any food, uh, food service background. Mm. I don't know where to get. Um, you know, ingredients and, and supplies and stuff like that. So finding, finding those kinds of mm -hmm. connections are really what's needed next, I think. Yeah. Good. We good? Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And next up we have Dottillo Custom Leather and Giuseppe Dottillo. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Giuseppe Dottillo, and I'm the creator and craftsman of Dottillo Custom Leather Goods here in Goleta, California. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the judges, Julie Sampson, and the entire New Venture Challenge as a whole. It's been a great experience, and I'm truly honored to be here. Dottillo Custom Leather Goods is a startup company founded by myself, Giuseppe Dottillo, and is dedicated to manufacturing the finest leather bags, belts, wallets, and other leather goods on the market today. Dottillo products have a unique style which blends traditional Western tooling with modern functional design that is unseen anywhere else in the marketplace. Oh, Dottillo Custom Leather Goods is a company founded on a family passion for craftsmanship and quality that has been carried down through generations. To those who knew my grandfather, the Dottillo name was synonymous with finely tailored clothing and is my vision at Dottillo Custom Leather Goods to restore the pride that was once associated with my family name. All Dottillo leather products bear the same logo that was once my grandfather's at his tailor store. Before I say my market analysis, I'd like to thank the Santa Barbara Public Library and all their wonderful librarians for giving me their resources and helping me get the information I needed. So according to the small business data website, Size Up, here in Santa Barbara alone, one to 1.1 million, $1 million is spent annually in leather goods. And small companies such as Saddleback Leather, who employs only three people, is making over a million dollars in sales last year. <coughs> Using Reference USA, it is clear when analyzing trends in the leather goods market that the market is steadily growing, and since 2016, a larger increase has happened. Dottillo Custom Leather Bags of Products bring together beautiful western style designs and modern functional features to create a product that has not been created before. Dottillo bags and products will be filling a niche in the marketplace and catering to those who want functionality and clean lines of a modern bag 
but are not willing to sacrifice style to have it. Although there are many different bag makers on the market today, most of them, none of them, offer the refined mixture of style and function that the Dottillo products do. One aspect that sets Dottillo Custom Leather apart from other startups is that I already have a full line of bags and other products made, they're already in production by myself, and sales are already being made. Customers who have purchased my products have been nothing but thrilled with the craftsmanship and detail that go into every single piece, and many of them have come back and bought more products from me. The target market for Dottillo Custom Leather is those who value handmade goods, well thought out designs, practicality, but do not want to sacrifice style to get those features. The primary means of promotion will be online through advertisements on social media because it is the one of the most cost efficient and effective means of targeting, of getting to my target market. Also, since most of my sales will be made online, it is fitting that advertisements will be primarily online as well. Materials are sourced locally at local distributors such as Goliger Leather and Ventura. Sourcing materials in person allows for me to hand select only the finest hides to create my products. The primary means of distribution will be online through a company website which will likely be set up with a host company to allow for smooth integration of e-commerce features. In-person sales will also continue by means of word of mouth and participation in events such as artisan fairs and makers markets. All right, now I'll give you a short overview of my products. This is not my full line, but for the sake of time, this is what I was able to bring. So I'll start with the classic tote. The classic tote features a large, spacious, and robust design, has an interior pocket and key ring, features a double-stitched exterior with corner rivets for added durability. This one is priced at $225 in the standard Excel leather and $275 for the tooled model. Next is the small, the small tote, which is virtually a scaled down version of the large one. Has all the same interior features, but has a detachable crossbody strap for those who carry less and want a more versatile bag. This one is priced at 165 for the Excel leather and 205 for the tooled. Next is the clutch. The clutch is a traditionally styled clutch. It has a snap closure on the front, snap closure on the pocket on the back, the standard clutch comes with a detachable wrist strap, but this model, the deluxe one, comes with a detachable crossbody strap to give you options. This one is priced at 115 for the standard, 135 for the standard tooled, and the deluxe is 155. Next is the most is the largest and most involved of the bunch. This is the Dottillo backpack. The Dottillo backpack features a strap style closure with a button for added security, a front pouch with a button for added security, a spacious main compartment with laptop sleeve and both in organization, a carrying handle, and adjustable leather shoulder straps which are mounted on rings for additional flexibility and comfort. Lastly is the original small purse. It's a traditionally styled small purse, strap closure, Adjustable crossbody strap, simple and classic. I also offer custom orders, which can be purchased for almost any of these bags, as well as any custom design that you could think of. Some custom orders of the past have been bags, belts, wallets, rifle stock covers, gun slings, uh, guitar straps, Bible covers, anything you can think of that you want tooled. So for my revenue model, for year one, wait, wait. all revenues will come from the sales of Dottillo products or by repairs necessary that don't fall under the, or the, under the warranty that comes with the bags. The major cash outflows of the business will be advertising, website fees, labor, and materials. Some one-time fees include acquiring a trademark, purchasing a card reader, and um, an initial investment into a beginning inventory. For my financial predictions, I chose to just insert the cash flow statement, that way you don't get lost in a big whole spreadsheet. So for year one, my revenue goal is $25,000, and these numbers reflect a projected sales of $25,405.
Break-even occurs during the first month after the additional investment into the beginning inventory pays itself off. Net profit for year one is $10,405. And uh, previous expenses and investments were not included into the financial forecast because they have already paid themselves off with previous sales. Startup capital earned here today will be invested directly into better machinery such as sewing machines, a burnishing machine, cutting dies, and other various tools which will both increase production capacity as well as allow for an even more refined and consistent product. I'd like to thank you all for your courtesy and attention. My name is Giuseppe Dottillo, and this is Dottillo Custom Leather. I'll bring these down so you guys can look at them. Just kind of... Okay, and we'll start the judges' questions. So how, how long does this backpack take to make, for example? So and, and as then, batch yeah. sizes increase, the time comes down. And also, in my cost of goods sold, I factored my labor in, so at $50 an hour. So one of those bags, a backpack like that, probably take me around three hours. The tote, about an hour and a half to two, and this one, about an hour, hour and a half. So it all depends on how big the bag is, really, and how detailed it is. Like, the backpack has a lot. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank Great you. Great job. Um, so you, you mentioned you're obviously selling, and you're selling yes. online, direct to consumer? No. So okay. it's been mostly just word of mouth sales. I don't have a website yet, so okay. really this competition pushed me in and was like, all right, this could be something you could do, so get going. So I still have all the formalities to do, but all this stuff <coughs> has been done, and most of my sales are word of mouth. Uh -uh. Um, are you comfortable being sort of the spokesperson on behalf of your brand when you oh. think about marketing online? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Good. Fantastic. Two questions. Um, <clears throat> I know you're just getting into this. Um, tell me what e-commerce platform you plan to utilize. For the website? Mm -hmm. Probably Shopify. It seems that that's the easiest one to get into, sure. and it's just straightforward. People really like using it, and that's the one I'll probably choose. Okay. My second question is this. How, um, how do your price points compare with your competitors? So my price points are very competitive. A lot of stuff, say totes, and we'll take local manufacturers, like there's a local in Santa Barbara, his name's Steven Soria, he owns a company called Makesmith. Mm -hmm. His totes about 270 for a veg tan standard one. Mine's 225, and my tooled one's 275. The only thing that really, I feel, brings a premium the tool products bring more of a premium, and the backpack brings more of a premium because sure. there's a lot going on in that one. Sure. And how easy is it for other in success? It's more than you can make. How many? How, how easy is it to transfer to other people to make to, and maintain quality? Uh, it would take some time. It would take some time to train somebody, but I feel that my production capacity right now, I could probably reach. I could probably produce enough to make around two hundred thousand dollars in sales if I were working full time. And how many, how many products is that? That was my question. So I have... Maximum uh, manufacturing capacity. So it all depends. It all depends on how much is being sold because certain bags take longer sure. than, say, a belt or stuff like that. So it really depends. I can't put a number on specific production capacity because it's all about what people buy. Okay. Thank you. And cool. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jake. Thank you. Jake. All right, and taking the stage next, we have Charlie Olin and Shot and Chaser. Thank you. Which oh, one yeah. is it? <laughs> testing, testing. <laughs> the judges are asking for samples. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I call on campus. Otherwise, I'd provide one. Okay, judges ready? Okay, timer, take it away. All right, hi everyone, my name is Charlie Olin. I'm from Sweden, and today I'm gonna to be talking about Sean and Chaser. Mixing cocktails take a lot of effort, and usually doesn't go as planned. One tends to look at a picture online that looks like this. No, wait, like this. <laughs> but usually end up with a product that looks more like this. <laughs> the craving that you have from the taste also comes from when it was made by a professional. But when you make it, it usually tastes more like this. 
And if you switch locations, which a lot of students here in Santa Barbara tend to do, you have to bring all the heavy bottles, there you go, <laughs> or pre-mix your drink into a smaller container and therefore risk getting an open container ticket. Shot and Chaser, which is trademarked, is an LLC company that provides you with all, that solves all of those problems. Our patent pending packaging allows people to pick between a variety of famous ready to drink cocktails. The product is separated into two compartments, the smaller one holding a shot of liquor uh, provided by the local manufacturer Cutler's Artisan, while the bigger one holds a matching mixer and comes from the Dr. Pepper and Snapple group. How it works is that you unseal the package and either tip the, uh, the liquor over into your mixer or you tear off the shot and drink it as is using the mixer as a chaser. Shot and Chaser gives the customers an interactive and effortless experience with a cocktail mixed to perfection. The specific operational structure looks like this. We manufacture our unique plastic containers in China, ship it to California where the liquor and mixer gets poured in uh, by our partners at Cutler's Artisan. Why this is is because they already have the necessary licenses in order to handle alcohol. Um, then when sealed, the product is transported to retailers where it will be sold to the end consumer. Any unit surplus will be taken to a Vanji logistics warehouse in which uh, it will be stored in a cold environment. The process might sound difficult and take a, lot, a bit of time to perfect, but timing is key in order to have first mover advantage. In an industry that grows at $74 billion a year with 6% growth, following trends are key. And the current trends point toward a market that is becoming more fragmented. Consumers are branching out and willing to try new things. Among these things are smaller packaging sizes and ready-to-drink beverages, all of which Shot and Chaser fits. But with trends comes competition. All of these competitors are still in early phases, and none of them have fully launched yet. But as you can see, we're all ready-to-drink products with mostly small packaging sizes. But while both Cut Water and Can Can are small in size, they have nothing special going on with packaging. What Shot and Chaser also brings to the table is the customer experience. Consumers get to interact with the product by mixing it themselves. And lastly, we're specifically targeting students. While being a B2B business, our end consumer will mostly consist of college and university students. We'll start in Santa Barbara, where there's an estimated 15,000 students within our targeted age group. But as I said, our target market mostly consists of other businesses. Liquor and grocery stores usually operate on very slim margins and are therefore required to carry a large variety of inventory in order to profit. In the Santa Barbara area, a total of 10 stores have agreed to try out our products, with four having signed actual purchase orders for 500 units per store. These orders, together with our primary research, justifies the idea's viability. According to our end consumers, uh, they drink alcohol about one to two times a week. And when doing so, they buy it for 25 bucks. Uh, out of that budget, they, spend about, they would spend about five to seven dollars on a shot and chaser product. And as even further proof of concept on, our most, on the most valuable question of all, they answered affirmative to buying the product. But outside of these early adopters, how will we expand our customer base? Through social media, of course. By establishing an early online presence we, where we brand ourselves and promote our product on Snapchat and Instagram, uh, we can quickly increase demand. We'd also launch with a two-for-one special on Instagram, so if customers post a picture with a product or a story, perhaps, and use the hashtag shot and chaser, we'll respond with a discount code. We're also planning to attend a trade show in Las Vegas in June. And lastly, we're also planning to sponsor parties in Isla Vista, where students can show up and get free samples. So let's get into our financial looks. Our cost per unit produced is at 50 cents. The wholesale price will be at 2.99 which leaves us with a profit margin of 249. To put this into perspective, our markup on every unit produced is at 400%. So with enough volume, we'll be, we'll, the profit potential is enormous. With expansion through the trade show in Vegas, we're expecting to break even in mid-August, and by the end of the year, netting about $242,000. But in order to make this dream a reality, we need investors. We're looking for a $50,000 $50, investment in exchange for 20% of Shot and Chaser. The, that investment puts us at an evaluation of $250,000, which comes from our projected net profit after year one. I will also be investing the full 5K from today's winnings while giving 500 away for the, a couple of friends that helped me out. 
And uh, for any future Series A investment, we'll also include the industry multiplier of 2.08. Uh, the funds will go towards startup costs, that, which includes the plastic mold for the actual production of our packaging in China, uh, the trade show in Las Vegas, and a company vehicle in order to make in-person sales. We'll also be there to help, uh, help with our original negative cash flow. So who is it that you'll be investing in? Alice and I have been students here in Santa Barbara for about three years now. Both of us are business majors and have previously worked on the several small businesses back in Sweden. I myself launched two small businesses with a couple of friends and also helped my mom develop several products in her business. While Alice has been working with the manufacturing internationally for two years before her current stint in the US. Uh, as advisors, my mom will come on board with her 14 years of experience managing her own business and also an angel investor by the name of Thomas Ward will help out. So in summary, we have already had signed purchase orders. Our name and logo is trademarked, and we have a patent pending on our unique packaging. We have licensed partners that have agreed to provide and handle liquid content. Uh, we, uh, and lastly, we have a unique product that follows the current industry trends. Shot and Chaser, an interactive and effortless experience with cocktails mixed to perfection. Thank you for listening. I'll now take some questions. How many different drinks are you planning on launching with and which ones and why? Yeah, so the original ones will be three different ones. It will be gin and tonic, rum and coke, and vodka cranberry. It's just three simple ones that I have uh, through our secondary data research showed to be most common. Um, did you find your factory directly? And if so, are you working with them directly? No, we went through Sourceify at first, which is a company based out in San Diego. They help with manufacturing in China and come, like connecting them with people in the US, I guess. Uh, but that didn't work out, so now we're working directly with uh, China Plastic Synergy Group in China. And do you know their ability to scale with your growth? Yes, and it's definitely there. They say they could uh, monthly produce up to 200,000 units. Watch that back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and I've asked this on several occasions. Uh, tell me your biggest need uh, outside of capital. Just I guess legal advice when it comes to licensing, when it, distributing of alcohol and all those laws, especially when I plan to extend my business outside of California, because in California I have a pretty good idea of how to do it, but when it comes to like open and closed states and that sort of stuff, it becomes very hard. So legal counsel for sure. Legal counsel. Question, what are your biggest needs for resources to help support you? So outside of capital, of course, <laughs> that would be uh, an extended advisory board outside of people back home in Sweden. So someone local that knows the market, a value adding investor perhaps. Anything else? <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>and they're more comfortable. They put their phones in more riskier places, such as when they're cooking, in the bathroom, and actually 8% of people tend to spill, uh, spill some sort of liquid on it. And even though we have wireless charging, we still use cords to charge our phones, until now. So I've spent the last year studying the induction process, and um, what we've actually found throughout the process is that when you put magnets around the induction coil, it pulls um, the induction away from the coil. And so with typical chargers, they actually um, don't utilize this. And we've studied it and have actually mastered a certain pattern that you can use the magnets with uh, specific magnetic um, forces to actually increase the QI coil strength. And so I went out and surveyed 157 people in my target market if they prefer my wireless charger over the uh, competition. And 93% of people said that they would prefer it. 
The other 7% of people said they just don't have a wireless rechargeable phone. But 100% of the people that said that they would prefer my solution said that they would spend anywhere from $35 to $40. Now let me get to my product. The flagship product is called the Raindrop. And after applying the universal steel plates to the back of your phone, you can peel the cover off of the back of the Raindrop, mount it to any desired surface, Obviously, after plugging it in. Um, and then once it's plugged in, you can actually mount your phone for a secure and wireless charge. Now, I gave this to 50 of my close friends, and what it's actually concluded is that nobody wanted to give it back. Um, <laughs> however, 26 of them addressed one main concern that my original prototype did not address, is that they actually wanted to have the ability to take their phone off of the wall while it's charging. And so I actually have made the charging portion of the phone removable. And so you can use your phone while you're in bed before you go to sleep and then just mount it back to your wall. Uh, so we are gonna be integrating this protected mount into a variety of products including our car charger, which can hit, sit in your AC vent, you get out of bed, plug it into your, mount it into your car, and a portable speaker that you can rest your phone on top of and it'll secure it and give it a wireless charge. Now for prototyping, there's supposed to be a check there. Um, I've actually 3D printed all these myself, um, engineered everything. Our, we're gonna source our first parts for the uh, 7,500 mounts in the US at our headquarters in Goleta from now up until March 2020. This is gonna be an average of 250 mounts per month. From then on, we're gonna start produ production in China where we will begin batches of 5,000 mounts and on. Now this is a great time to enter the market because just right now, or the last couple of years, is $3.7 billion market. And according to BIS research, by the year 2023, it's projected to hit a $24 billion market, and that's not even including 20, or yeah, 2026 when it's $225 billion market. In my survey, I asked 156 people if they had a wireless rechargeable phone yet, and 146 people already do have it. <clears throat> now there's, I don't know why it's doing this, um, but, with my competition, we have Xvita, which is um, a wall charger that sits like that, but I actually asked the, uh, the, my target market what they would like out of their, my product. I um, said, like, you are making a product that holds up my expensive phone. I want it to hold up my phone. They actually have very weak magnets, but they have a really good um, charging current. So like the magnets actually aren't strong enough to pull all the induction away from the charger. And you also need a case for it. So it's actually like very environmentally not friendly. It's very wasteful. Our other competition, Magnum Mount, only focuses on car chargers. They have very strong magnets, but actually lack the ability to charge your phone fast. They are, um, they are not universal, and um, there is obviously no case required. Me, on the other hand, we have mastered this form of magnets around the QI coil and have a protected technology that far surpasses all of them. So, so far we have put a copyright on the artwork used to produce the steel play that goes on the back of your phone. We have our trademark logo. We're gonna, we are obviously have a patent pending for our innovative technology. And we are gonna get liability insurance and put a warning label on all of our products. Now let me put you into the shoes of my customer. My, my, my customer is gonna be wealthy, usually between the ages of 17 and 30. Can be males or females, have a luxurious lifestyle, they tend to go to festivals. Um, they use social media and love experiencing life. Why them? Because, you know, they're young, they like to use their phones, and they're very trendy. Um, to reach these people, we're gonna go through three, separate st uh, three different stages. For our phase one, we are gonna sell to the 115 people that are already ready to buy, and we're gonna follow up on getting advice on what we can do better. Once it hits September of this year, we're gonna engage and advertise through Instagram campaigns and give away products and have consistent promotions and contests. And then once we hit phase three, we're, when we'll start mass producing in March 2020, we're gonna actually release our car mount and wireless speaker to expand the product line and promote, <laughs> promote universality. So far to date, we have our finished product designs, we have acquired business status as an S Corp, we have applied for patent protection for our innovative technology, we have open and make account, and we have our logos, domains, and package designs. Lots of numbers, um, but I'll break it down for you. For our retail, we're gonna be selling them for $40, which gives us $22.28 in profit, which is a 55.7% profit margin. 
Even at wholesale, signing at $25, it still gives us a $7.28 profit with a 30% profit margin. Now with our net profit in August, we will get $2,922. Our source of, of funding, um, which includes my personal savings, winnings from today, and families, of friend, families and friends, which totals to $11,000, would be way more than enough to um, start this business, which costs $6,078. Our exit strategy is to sell a Mophie, which is owned by Zag. Zag recently purchased Mophie two years ago for $100 million, which already shows that they have uh, they buy other companies. And uh, with my team right now, we have me, who is the product designer, engineer, and CEO, Austin Denoche, our attorney and accountant, Garrett Gilbert, who has been making a graphic or who has been our graphic designer and music producer, Judith Schelling, who's been uh, giving us a lot of her free time to put together the patents and be our IP lawyer and Skylar Labrie, who is our head of marketing and sales. Now, when I was in fourth grade, I told my uh, teacher that I was gonna make shoes that could let you walk on water. As you can see, these are not shoes, but it's a great start. Um, but today, I have invented the best possible way that you can mount your phone for a secure and wireless charge. Thank you. So the patent is for the, the magnetic charging, or? Um, so it's, I specifically put the patent on the um, surrounding areas around the induction coil, because the locations that I actually have the magnet set away from the induction coil um, help the mag magnetic charge pull and get to your phone, pretty much. So that's what the patent is, and then we're gonna be integrating into all, all of our products. That was one of my questions too. So, have you looked into a utility patent or? A yeah, that's what we filed. It is a utility. Yeah, okay. it is a utility. I should have specified. Sorry. Okay, great. So, um, you can actually produce this for around twenty dollars. Um, so it actually costs fourteen dollars to make the product, and that's even in the U.S. Me assembling it myself. Uh -huh. um, once I get it produced in China, I can actually manufacture it using high quality parts for around nine fifty. Okay, and, and, and what do you think your maximum um, manufacturing capacity is going to be? Um, I would say 100,000 units. Okay. I don't think we're ever going to get to that. Okay. And where, uh, you might have mentioned this, but how are you going to market? Where are you planning on selling this through? Um, mostly social media. We're going to be, I have a lot of connections on Instagram. Some um, who are social figures and some upwards of 100,000 followers. I've already contacted them. They'd be more than happy to represent this luxurious product on their luxurious Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be selling on like Amazon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, Amazon, Instagram. Sorry, I probably didn't get the question. Yeah. yeah, Instagram and mostly Amazon for sure. Have you went through that process of establishing those relationships? Um, with the pub, with the uh, Instagram people, mm -hmm. yeah. So they're they're already close friends. Most of them I actually went to college with um, and lived with an IV. Okay. okay. Can I see the unit real quick? The back of the unit. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. Um, uh, that's okay. We'll do it during the transition. Yeah. Let's Just say one. thank you. To the right. And next up, we welcome to the stage Drift Salon and Rebecca Murphy. Hi, my name is Rebecca Murphy, owner of Drisp Salon, and this is no regular salon. Under the law, cosmetic beauty products and ingredients do not need FDA approval, pre-market approval, and this statement is straight from the FDA's website. To combat the lack of regulation, on top of our standard services, we are going to offer hair mineral analysis, which identifies the presence of toxic metals and mineral status within the body. This is key to optimal health. Second, we will offer free product label analysis based on current scientific toxicology knowledge. So our clients are aware of the current products they are putting on their, the largest absorbent organ of their body. Drift Salon will continuously strive to offer beauty from the outside in. We will provide quality of organic products, education on wellness, and the ease of booking online at a good price. 
What validates, validates this venture is that 90% of the 35 surveyed want organic products over conventional products. So for a little background about myself, I'm a natural born leader with five years of managerial experience plus two years as a hairstylist. I have found that creative and wellness orientated businesses lack the back end um, operational skills. I believe I have the ideal balance between creativity and management for this venture. We project that 80% of our customers will be women and our target market is women ages 25 to 40 years old. They are beachy, easygoing, and care about what's in their products. They are found at farmers markets as well as local events. Second, our second demographic we are going to be targeting is the man in her life. And these demographics are interested in us because of our, their ongoing search for overall health. So let's get into the industry. The beauty industry is economically resilient. For example, in 2008, it brought in 52 billion, and for the next three years, only fluctuated between 52 and 53. This shows that the industry remains stable even with economic turbulence. Also, in 2016, the market for organic products brought in 11 billion, and it's projected to grow 90% by 2024. So let me just demo the first, our customer experience. Since our customers wanted ease, we will be using Mind and Body, which is on the left-hand side for our online booking, and we'll have a receptionist available for contact during salon hours. When the client walks into the salon, we have our four stages in which they go through. Our first one is our greeting. This stage, we want our customers to feel at home, and we do this by walking them through, giving them a tour, a complimentary beverage, and just conversating with them. Excuse me. Second, we have our consultation. We want to understand our clients' wants and needs to effectively execute the service. At this time, if they do want current products to be analyzed, we can do that here. Third, we have our service. We take time to produce the desired look using eco-color products. We are the only salon carrying these products in our distribution area. This product is extremely important because it doesn't contain the toxic active ingredients of regular hair color and most natural hair color. And then stage four is our clothing, closing, excuse me. We want to educate the clients on what is used and the maintenance for the service they've received. At this time, we retain clients by suggesting rebooking. We want them leaving refreshed and feeling beautiful, knowing that if they are knowing we are there for them if they run into any challenges in between their appointments. For our milestones, here we can see our milestones to date. And my next step in the process is securing funding, like I'm doing today, um, to ultimately launch in 2020. For our competition, we surveyed 35 people, um, and these were their triggers for buying up above. Drift will be the only salon in our distribution area that meets the criteria of our customers. When it comes to our legalities, we will protect our trade secrets, such as our client color formulas, and obtain liability insurance. And we do have an IP consultant to address further issues. So how are we going to go to market? In our first step, we anticipate receiving clients from our competitors. So in phase one, we will launch our informational website to attract our customer. As well, we will also network through Facebook and Instagram to engage our clientele by posting information and responding to direct messages and comments. For phase two, we will target like-minded businesses at opening, such as the Encinitas Farmers Market, uh, yoga studios, Viore Clothing, and holistic health centers. We will have joint events and offer reciprocal coupons, not to mention the hair analysis results can be used by our clients' practitioners to help further their health journey. So for phase three, which will be three months into our venture, we will um, communicate with Dr. Mercola, who is a major holistic health influencer, and he's actually a personal connection of mine. He will write an article validating their services, giving us that little extra credibility. Here we have my financial forecast, as well as my cash flow statement. So let's get into the numbers. So for the first year, we are projected to make about 812,000 with expenses about 727,000, equaling to about 85,000 in net profit. That's a 10% net profit margin, which is actually above our industries, which is about 8.2% in 2018. We are said to break even in month four at 56,000. And here you can see that our non-toxic hair color services will bring in the highest profit margin, so we will be focusing on that service. 
when it comes, as you can see, these are my applications of funding and my sources of funding, and note my aim for the good fortune of winning today. For my exit strategy, we plan to sell to a like-minded business owner who doesn't want to start a salon from the ground up and hopes that they can take this business to the next level. And here we have my amazing team who covers all core business areas such as marketing, accounting, IP legal, and finance. And so why should we win today? We should win today, today because of the health conscious and environmental impact Thrift Salon can bring to the beauty industry. Thank you. Travis and I won't be your first customer. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that when you guys came out, I was like, ooh. <laughs> Clean up every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> ease of use, ease yeah. of use. Yeah. <laughs> Are you considering doing your own products too? You kicked off with the fact that the FDA doesn't approve everything that comes yeah, into not, the market. So. Yeah, it's not pre-market approved. Right. So we actually, so once we start our salon, we're in hopes to expanding, and once there's more revenue, to hopefully have our own, hopefully have our own um, product line. Fortunately, I do have connections with the health industry. My father is a holistic health doctor, and so he has his own practice. And I've worked through and I've studied a little bit of toxicology and what's gone into it. So I've gone through the back end of that work, but um, that's going to be the goal in the upcoming, upcoming years. Yeah. Uh, second question, since I have the hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, feel free to interrupt. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Um, so I love your go-to-market. You know, it's super clear with all the steps. You've got Dr. Mercola. Mm -hmm. um, could he be a strategic investor to you as well? Um, possibly, yeah. He is a friend of my father's, so I do have connections with him. And actually, it's a good point. I haven't reached out to him on that end, but it definitely could be a possibility, especially uh, with his resources. I like the science piece. It gives a validation and credibility, yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. um, it's a great key strategic partner. Mm -hmm. But I think it could also be a key strategic investment partner as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was certainly uh, one of my questions as well. I mean, do you have a business contractual relationship with Dr. McCola that, that really gave it a lot of credibility? So with him, it's only been verbal so sure. far, um, since he is a friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, in the future, once we kind of get moving with this venture financially, then it will be one of my like, top concerns is to kind of get that contract, okay. especially after talking with my IP and legal um, help. Good. Um, and maybe I missed this. Do you not have any current physical locations right now? Or you just... No, we don't have any current okay. physical locations. I'm here in Santa Barbara if anyone needs anything. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are hoping once we get the finances to start up to kind of get it going. But I've already done my research. I've already went down there, and I have a building in mind. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Rent It and Tegan Murphy. Timer ready? Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello, judges. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. I'm Tegan Nibby, and I will be presenting Rent It. Uh, the problem that Rent It solves is the massive overproduction and overconsumption uh, of goods that has taken hold in America over the last few decades. Americans spend $1.2 trillion every year on non essential goods and services. Yet 80% of the items we own are used less than once a month. The storage industry in our country is now worth $38 billion, and self-storage construction has become the number one growing commercial real estate sector to keep up with our materialistic obsession. Our dream is to create a more sustainable marketplace for uh, the consumer economy, providing locally sourced and deliverable consumer goods to those looking to get the most value out of their purchases. This all started when my co-founder and I were searching for a way that we could rent out a motorcycle for day-to-day -day use as college kids, but found there was no suitable market uh, platform looking to provide a value-based rental transaction. As time went on, uh, we felt an increasing need for other temporary use items that would be inefficient to purchase permanently as students, including bikes, electric longboards, uh, televisions, furniture, yard supplies, and power tools. We wanted to create a platform that would allow people to satisfy their basic needs in an affordable fashion, as well as more unique needs like specialized photography equipment and other hobbyist and creative essentials. Uh, with an app-based rental and purchase marketplace, 
Uh, we plan to create a community source platform for sustainable and value-based lending within neighborhoods and cities, as well as a new passive income source for those looking to clear up space in their homes. Our app will allow millions of people in the U.S. with limited disposable income to fill their needs for temporary goods um, as, oh, sorry, uh, without having to make large and rapidly depreciating purchases. Insurance will come standard with every single rental, and delivery option will be available for convenient uh, same-day delivery for any class of an item a user might request. We have committed a customer service team on site in each market area to ensure that lenders' uh, items are properly handled throughout each transaction window. The main product classes that Rendit would be targeting are appliances, electronics, equipment, uh, and equipment, representing a combined $66, uh, 66 billion dollar yearly revenue market. Americans are expected to spend 690 billion dollars on e-commerce in the next year, and we plan to redirect some of this traffic from traditional purchase sites to our more sustainable equipment sharing solution. There has been a rising level of comfort for peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces since the Airbnb revolution, um, and now is the perfect time to introduce the option for users to rent items and specialized equipment from the community around them. Zipcar and Turo expanded the sharing economy from housing to car rentals, and now there are 71 million people who participate in the sharing economy every single year, and that number is growing by 10 million every single year. In our survey of 105 UCSB students, 96% of respondents said that they would be interested in participating in a peer-to-peer -peer renting marketplace, with 75% looking to rent out their own items, and 60, uh, uh, sorry, rent out items from their peers, and 69% looking to post their own items for rental use. Uh, our main target market for users renting out items will be value-oriented value individuals interested in sustainable approaches to consumption, more specifically college students with high levels of debt and low disposable income, as well as tourists looking for short-term rental contracts um, on items that will allow them to get around and try out new activities. We're also look at, looking to be targeting uh, hobbyists, specialists, and creative communities uh, of members looking to try out and buy specialized items for their needs and passions. For lenders, we will be targeting older generations who have more available non-essential goods laying around, but we plan to frame the app as a, as a way for any user to rent out their inessential goods to make a new passive income source. When a user enters the app, they'll be directed to log in or register and being, uh, sorry, uh, to log in or register to be, before being able to browse items and view their profile. The profile page allows for users to uh, see their pending notification, enter forms of payment, and view all private information about the history of payments and income made on res uh, rent it. Users are able to browse items as soon as they enter an email address, though a user will have to link their account to a state ID or social security number before they're able to make or post rentals so as to ensure proper identification for insurance and payment security. Browsing consists of a personalized product feed as, I'm oh, sorry, that's one too late. <laughs> Browsing consists of a personalized product feed as well as a categorical search filter and a geographic page for users to explore the closest items available. After a user finds an item they're uh, interested in, they can message the owner through the app to arrange for a pickup, delivery, or to negotiate a potential change in the rental fare. When a request is sent from one user to another, it shows up on the item's pending page before being confirmed by both parties. If a user is looking to post one of their items to the app, it's as simple as entering the product name, category, estimated value, requested rate, and taking a few pictures before setting up the pickup location. Once all of this posting has been completed, renters will be able to see the item uh, and message the lender to iron out the details of the transaction. I'm proud to announce that as of March 28th, we've begun full back-end uh, support for the design shown in the last few slides. We have just enough saved between my co-founder and I uh, for the beginning stages of production, and we're currently working on securing funds through two fundraisers in San Francisco and Coronado to ensure continuous uh, development funding. We plan to use these funds for the development of our prototype before releasing the beta to our target markets in Isla Vista, Coronado, and Palo Alto this summer. Similar e-commerce e marketplaces like Craigslist and Amazon develop their competitive adva advantage by uh, offering strong processing value and reliable selection of goods available in their, in their market. We will be positioning ourselves as a value-based marketplace similar to Craigslist, but with more capabilities better security, and an easier to use interface to gain competitive advantage. From our survey, we learned that one of the main determining factors for our uh, target market's platform choice was quick delivery, so we'll be uh, working to ensure that all delivery requests are handled within the day. Uh, the first phase of our business will basically consist of getting the prototype app and running in our target neighborhoods and cities in California. We've begun marketing to online communities in each of our target areas to spread the word of our open beta and give people the opportunity for 10 free rentals uh, with no added fee for first adopters. 
We have team members in each California community and employees ready to start with customer service in each town as soon as the prototype is ready to uh, be released for, to first adopt. Phase two will begin with, uh, as soon as we've gotten enough feedback from our beta to make changes to the app flow and feature structure, we will be expanding the areas surrounding uh, our testing markets to gain a more reliable supply and demand in each market location. And we plan to release a services page on the app that will allow people to post services offered in any sort of service category. In our, th uh, actually, I'm going to skip this. Oh, sorry. I'm going to skip this because I'm running low on time. Um, here are all the financials. Very tiny font. I'll move on. Um, our planned revenue structure uh, will be mostly percentage-based fees charged on both the lender, lender and the renter. Uh, and uh, we will be charging 15% of the price uh, posted to the app for the uh, renters and a much smaller portion for the lenders, probably around 5%, uh, so the app can gain traction as a legitimate passive income source for uh, users. For a successful launch, we'll need enough seed funding for $45,000 of development costs, $35,000 for payment of employees, and $20,000 for our marketing and promotional incentive budget. Uh, if we're Successful in obtaining around 10,000 in fundraising capital over the next few months and raising 75,000 from angel investors in exchange for equity, we would have just enough to get through our projected first year costs and establish ourselves in our target markets. The new venture challenge winnings would give us a huge edge uh, in the beginning of our operations and would allow us to get significantly more market traction through promotional activities and market coverage. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Okay, judges. So a lot of people have tried to beat Craigslist, and Craigslist hasn't changed since basically 1997. Why do you think this will be able to compete and take away people from Craigslist? Uh, basically, I think it's it's uh, much greater capability in terms of um, more valuable uh, product categories like uh, consumer electronic equipment and vehicles, modes of transportation that people wouldn't be looking to buy, like fully outright, they depreciate fairly quickly, so uh, the value from just having a temporary contract is, is pretty high. Um, and yeah, I think it, it'll be super useful for like daily and weekly rentals just in neighborhoods, uh, just for basic needs that people don't want to spend like a bunch for a power drill. You can just have one for a day. It's a lot easier. Uh, I Great presentation. I love the, the shared economy approach. I really think that you know, we're on the tip of the iceberg of what that continues to unveil. I think of liability, and that may have been the end of your presentation, but um, can you just speak to that? What, what sort of preparation are you doing to uh, make sure that people are sort of covered from a liability So uh, we're getting in contact with a company called Lemonade Inc. Uh, that does AI-based insurance um, structures um, but basically the, the insurance will be run through everyone's identification so uh, anything any blowback from people trying to commit fraud or having damaged uh, items will kind of go right back to them and the insurance will be dealt with in that way um, <clears throat> do you have the rights to the name rented uh, not yet but we're looking to establish an LLC and get everything started okay. in the next few weeks all right uh, last question uh, how are you going to drive traffic to your marketplace? Um, basically, we'll be looking to, um, like, can I answer that? Um, uh, but we'll be looking to, like, promote through different community um, organizations and offer up, like, uh, as soon as we have, like, a few thousand emails sure. for, uh, like, first stage starting, okay. um, we'll be sending out promotional activities for them so uh, everyone can kind of get on board as soon as possible. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. Okay, and next up we have Bakleesh and Brandon Mitchell. Hello, my name is Brandon Mitchell, and I'm here to present my company, Buckle Leash, innovating the stability of the modern surf leash. So for those of you who don't know, a surf leash is basically a device that connects your ankle to your surfboard, keeping it from washing in. So the problem we have with the modern day surf leash is the deterioration of Velcro. Um, after a few months with a surf leash, you get debris caught on the leash, fuzzballs, sticks, things like that. 
And so a problem would be, um, say a wave comes and the Velcro comes loose, you have a possibility of hurting others, losing your board, damaging your board, and when the surf picks up, that's really not something you want to have to be worrying about. about. So with the buckle, it adds extra stability and extra trust in your equipment, especially when the surf picks up. So here's a photo of Alicia had for about two or three months. It got all sorts of debris, I pink fuzzballs in it, random stuff. And the next day I went out and surfed, and it just ripped right off. The leash itself didn't break, but the Velcro came loose, and I lost my board, and it blew into the rocks. Our survey results were very positive. We did, we did 100 surveys with just with spe specifically my questionnaire, not including feedback from friends. Um, 70 saw a problem with the modern-day Velcro, and surprisingly, 25 were ready to buy when available. They did agree that the Velcro did become less effective over time, and then there was not many alternatives. So we plan to increase longevity and stability. Market opportunity is great. We have $50 billion per year being produced in the surf equipment industry itself. One of our main competitors, Decine, according to the USA Reference Database at the Santa Barbara Library, produces a consistent $17 million per year. The industry as a whole has grown 4% since 2012 and will continue to grow 6% through 2022. Through the USA database, we found that 11,387 people in Santa Barbara are, in are interested in outdoor recreation, so it promises viability to target those people starting out. The customer analysis would be predominantly male, obviously surfers ages 17 to 32. Um, they're always looking for something new and innovative and something that provides an edge. We plan on starting in Santa Barbara and expanding down to Southern California and eventually nationwide. The product itself is a urethane cord here. You've got a neoprene anklet, nylon webbing with a plastic buckle. You've got molded urethane and two stainless steel swivels on each end and the rail saver to connect it to the board. One of our three prototypes has officially been developed, and the materials are all sourced in California for the, pr the price of $10. So the final prototype development and launch is expected in August 2019. And for distribution, we plan to get a UPS commercial account. Copyright, things like slides, photos, marketing materials. Um, we plan on getting a trademark on the word buckle leash and the logo we still are working on. Trade secrets, not many, but we have client lists and marketing strategies, which will be labeled confidential. Patents, we've been working with Brett G. Anderson, a Ventura-based IP attorney, and he did confirm that the buckle technology is patentable, and we expect to have a provisional patent next month. Liability, we plan to get an LLC and business insurance, and we've applied for a business license, fictitious business name, and business name registration in the local, locally in Santa Barbara. Phases. So phase one, we plan to engage customers through local surf shops, trade shows, Instagram marketing campaigns, and we have, we're going to have pro surfers test and endorse the product who I'm connected to. And in phase one, we hope to have 1,500 products sold with five to 700 customers. Phase two, People can find this at their local surf shop or on our website directly to consumer, or you can look up and find your closest surf shop that will hold, that has the product if you want to go check it out yourself instead. So we plan on getting recognition through rep, representatives, podcasts, online media surf publications such as Surfline Product Guide and Stab Product Review, which is a quarterly um, thing, which have large followings with over a million people visiting. Uh, Buckley plans to have great customer service and communication and sell 3,500 products in year in the phase totaling to 5,000 with 1,600 customers in year one. After year one, we plan to innovate the product based on customer feedback and we plan to expand to bordering states as well as the East Coast where myself, the owner, is from and have connections to the surf industry there as well. At this point, Buckleach will have brand recognition and will be endorsed by sponsored riders and major professionals in the industry. For the financials, we have business to business and business to consumer. So it costs 10 bucks, we have $16 wholesale to surf shops, which will be our main revenue stream. And then through our website, we'll have direct to consumer for $25 with $15 profit. 
Our total revenue will be 62,820 by the end of year one with a $10,520 net income, breaking even in month four. Startup funding is going to be $19,000. We have two locally based angel investors who have pitched the idea to who are on board to fund part of the money we need. With personal savings and today winning the new venture challenge, we'll have more than enough to start our business with things like rent and uh, insurance and attorneys and things like that. Eventually, we would want to sell to a main competitor such as FCS or Dekine. Dekine is a large surf leash company that has been known to acquire other companies and uh, it's something we would thoroughly look into when the business takes off in three to seven years. Our team is myself, the CEO, finances and customer service, we have Cole Tashman, a our first representative in web design, two product design engineers who will then step on as the leaders for the manufacturing process, and the promoter and social media, Clay, and then our IP attorney, Brett G. Anderson. We should win today because we have a motivated group, an innovative group of individuals that are ready to take on the surf industry by storm. We have a one-of-a-kind technology unprecedented and never been seen before in the industry and our patent will give us a competitive advantage. A prototype is being worked on day in and day out and we're making strides towards our August launch every day. I may not have the best PowerPoint, but I feel like our team and our passion, we're ready to do this and we're going to, so thank you. Check it out. It was prototype one. Yeah. Nice. I actually thought it was a great PowerPoint. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not good with the slides. Yeah. So, um, question: I didn't catch your retail price. Remind me of that. The retail price was twenty-five dollars. Okay. And what's your competition at without the buckle? Without the buckle, it would be. I would say we have a competitive price. It would be between. 25 and even $50 for some of the newest products. Great. Uh, just Average would be about $30 retail. Yes, yeah, so I look at this as a little bit of a premium product. You're offering another benefit to yeah. your consumers, right? So don't yeah. be shy to maybe price that up a little bit. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, and my other question was you're manufacturing locally, which is great. Yeah. Have you also sourced outside of the United States just to get another idea of price? We have not yet. Um, we're, we're currently developing our prototype. So we, we imported our urethane cords from Semi Valley. That was the cheapest we could find. And sourced other things locally, um, produced in a small. We've looked into a manufacturing facility. And that would be one problem that we would run into was um, expanding and hiring more employees, which I accounted for in my finances, which is why the net profit may seem a bit low for the revenue. But we, we're going to have to hire representatives um, so I don't have to go down to San Diego or go every day. We're going to hire representatives. We already have one, but to spread to surf shops like surf reps. There's a lot of different brands like Rip Curl and Billabong who have surf reps who travel to the shops and show the new products and get them in the stores. Yeah. Right. How much does it actually cost to make the, uh, the buck leash? It's $10. It's $10. As okay. of right now for, for that prototype, okay. which is one of three. Okay. And we're, yeah, we're working on number two now. And is a patent specific to buck any kind of any kind of buckle on a leash a surf leash? yeah on a surf leash and it, the buckle on the surf leash it is what we will have a provisional patent for we're working on mid mid next month and uh, how many surfboards have you lost before uh, uh, with this velcro problem I'd say probably 20 20 yeah 20? I mean not lost them but to the beach you know okay the main problem is when the surf's big and you have to bail your board if, I mean, I've had leashes break plenty of times, but the Velcro thing just came enough times where I was like, all right, we need to, we need to change this. Mm. Yeah. Cool. And next up we have Marcos Flores with Aquanaut. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marcos Flores, and my company is Aquanaut Diving Service. And just to give you guys a heads up on what our diving service is, is that we perform tasks underwater while breathing compressed air from the surface. 
We're going to be launching in July 2023. I'm sorry, July 2020 in the Huntington Beach Marina. Do any of our judges have a yacht or a boat? Do you guys ever want to own one, possibly? <laughs> well, when you guys do, if you guys have it parked in the marina, you're going to have to deal with the same thing that all the vessel owners deal with when they have their vessel parked in the marina. And that problem is biofouling. Biofouling is the unwanted settlement of marine growth onto a hull of a vessel and its mechanical parts underneath. It occurs in a soft and hard growth form, as you can see in algae, barnacles, and mussels. The short-term problem is that this increases drag, which slows down the boat's performance and increases fuel consumption by up to 50%. The long-term problem is that it could ultimately destroy the bottom of the boat and its mechanical parts underneath through corrosion. Aquanaut Diving Service provides a solution to this problem. We service and clean, inspect, and present our work through underwater photography and videography. And what makes us different is that we are environmentally conscious in our cleaning techniques, innovative in our approach, and expert divers that are detail-oriented. The marina service services is a $5 billion industry that is forecast to grow at an annual compound rate of 4% between 2019 and 2023. July 2020, which is our launch, is an ideal time. Currently, at the Huntington Breach Marina, the marina slips and docks are all full, which is good, but that indicates that there is a cap to our service available market. Therefore, in month nine, we will explore or expand to Newport Marina, where the uh, total available market will increase over 200%. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why not just start at Newport Marina? But the purpose of this is for the company to evolve from a small fish in a medium pond to a big fish in a big pond. Newport Marina is in the same county and just a few miles south, so the exploitation of this marina has huge upside potential and very little downside risk. In, in conducting our primary research, we discovered that our target market is 94% male, 94% white, and 100% middle-aged with an above average income. <laughs> They are seeking quality and economy in a service provider. And when asked, what do you use your vessel for, the most common answer was some type of weekend warrior activity, such as fishing or sailing. And I also got a lot of, hey, we like to hang out and drink beer. <laughs> Our mission is to provide high-valued services with the most gratifying customer experience. Aquanaut Diving Service does that in a three-step process, beginning with the sign-up form that can be completed on our website or through face-to-face -face on a hard copy form. Once completed, along with the customer agreement, a work order can be generated and the customer can schedule its cleaning on our digital company scheduler. Step two is where we deliver our high-valued service, followed by step three, where we reach out to the customer to go over the inspection report that's gonna be sent out digitally to them. And in the final step is also where we wanna schedule the next service, possibly signing up them up for a subscription and seeking out um, customer referrals. <clears throat> the vision of the company is for me, the CEO, to step back from diving. With the Aquanaut Diving Service System, of intake and follow-up, the company can be self-sustained self as long as the delivery can still be made. For this, the company will reach out to other marine tech graduates from the City College to see if anybody is in need for part-time or temporary work in Southern California. Most marine technology students who are currently in the program work part-time part for Salty Dog, which is the most highly reputable hull cleaning service company in Santa Barbara so the divers are already trained well. 
Spending less time in diving, I will focus on customer service feedback and generate another revenue stream in hull anti-fouling painting. We will also look to invest in pneumatic tools that will speed up cleaning time and reduce diver fatigue, ultimately leading to the better quality of service. Here is how we stand against our competition using the customer's key purchasing criteria. Aquanaut Diving Service has everything except reputation, which our <laughs> reputation isn't bad, we're just not well known yet. Also, as you can see, Warner Bayside and Barney Coles have a declining reputation due to the lack of quality and service and outdated payment options. A DBA license a DBA and business license, along with insurance, need to be attained. Also, a permit from the city and the individual marinas. The company name and logo needs to be trademarked, and a copyright for our website content needs to be attained because our head of marketing is going to perform a detailed keyword research and analysis within the industry and populate these keywords on our website. Having the best search engine optimization strategy will have us rank number one on Google. That way, when somebody Googles hall cleaning service in Southern California, we'll pop up. Our superiority in digital and face-to-face -face marketing will allow the company to be successful in our launch and expansion. We will soon need more marine tech divers. <clears throat> the first goal in our sales plan is to obtain 80 customers within the first four months. Our sales to date is currently $130 from, for a one-time cleaning from one single customer. This is the financial projection analysis for year one. I'll go ahead and give you the highlights. The net profit for year one is just under 20000 breaking e even shortly after the 10th month. It is a service business, so the profit margin is 99% with most expenses coming from labor costs. 11,000 is needed for the startup costs, and we hope from the, for the funds to come from the new venture challenge and investors, but the company will also utilize small business loans for military veterans. The exit strategy is to step back from all operations while maintaining ownership and having a monthly cash flow income. Another exit strategy is to sell a fraction of the company or 100% of one of the companies. And the last strategy is to completely cash out and sell 100% of everything. My team starts with Don Barkelmis, who was my marine diving technology instructor and is retiring this year, but has agreed to come on as a diving advisor. Alex Moreno is my head of marketing and is also my business advisor. And myself, Marcos Flores, is the CEO, diver technician, and customer service representative. I should win because Aquanaut Diving Service is gonna be highly profitable. Um, we're environmentally conscious and we're gonna create employment opportunities for Santa Barbara City College Marine Technology alumni. Thank you. I'll go. Sure. Hey, great job. Thanks. Um, not knowing a lot about this space, um, I had a couple of questions. So on your competitive analysis, um, are the other companies that you would be competing with focusing on sort of an eco-friendly approach to how they service in this business? Through my research, no, not at all. Great, okay. And then um, what's the average cost? I mean, I'm sure it's based on size of vessel and things of that nature, but can you give me sort of an average cost? Sure, you're absolutely right. So. Um, I guess the standard is $1.50 per foot. So let's say we got a 20-foot sailboat. Um, $1.50 is going to be about $30 a cleaning. And right now, I think I have a, my average cleaning is about $75 per vessel, and that's accounting for the small vessels and the huge yachts. Got it. Okay. And then last question. Is there a seasonal cycle to this service? Great question. Yes. Um, in the summer and spring months, um, you get a lot more... Uh, 
the boats are, some, some people will dry dock the boats, like, hey, I'm going to take my boat out of the water during the uh, winter months because I'm not going to be using it. And then also, too, the warmer water speeds up that microbial growth and biofouling, so the boats get a lot dirtier during the summertime. Got it. Thank you. Is your model a, um, is it a monthly uh, reoccurring revenue model? Yes. We want to, ultimately, we want to sign them up on a subscription sure. where um, they, I clean their boat on a monthly service. Okay. And so, you know, since it's somewhat seasonal, uh, how would that, um, you know, impact the monthly uh, revenue model? Um, it would it would slightly it would slightly go down. It would have a like the peaks and valleys, so it's mm -hmm. it would slightly kind of go down on those colder months. Um, well, I'm sorry, can you no, no, repeat no, no. that? I mean, uh, yeah, you're, you're you're along the same. same oh, okay, yeah. About, so. so it would it will slightly go down, but um, most people keep their boat in there year round, sure. just because, especially if you have a huge yacht, you can't park it in your driveway, and it's too much to dry dock it and store it in a garage. So I'm going to keep my slip and just pay for that monthly service. Okay, all right. Excellent, okay. and that's time. Thank you. Congratulations. The judges have worked really hard during this break. I hope you had some time to enjoy yourself, and I'm wondering who you think the winner is going to be. Well, we're going to find out uh, what the judges think right here, right now. So I'm going to... Um, hand the microphones over to the judges, and we'll go from there. So real quickly, uh, the first thing I want to say is, you know what, thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful experience for the judges. We, we had a blast doing this. Uh, I think you all are very talented individuals. Uh, it's amazing to see your thought pro process and as you go through this. And I, I want to let you know, uh, as an entrepreneur just like you, um, I have, I've started eight different businesses. I failed at five of them. I will say that, okay? So the most important thing that I can say to you, um, you gotta keep the faith because there's gonna be more bad days than good days and the only time that you truly fail is when you don't, when you decide not to get up the next day and go and pursue your dream. And so I'm gonna say keep doing that. A um, lot of wonderful good things, a uh, lot of good companies uh, and just because you're not successful today does not mean anything. Does not mean anything. So. Uh, with that. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, fantastic day. So everybody did a fantastic job, really great presentations. And this was hard for us. We had a hard time sort of distilling this down. Um, so we'll start with number three. And um, I'm going to put my glasses on here. So um, the the third sort of runner-up um, is Datillo Custom Leather, and, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I, I'd like to say a few quick things here first. Um, you know, something that you cannot create as a brand or a new company is a legacy. And I think what you have done a great job of is taking your family legacy and turning it into a continual artisanal movement. Um, your products are stunning, um, handcrafted. You can feel and smell and, and just see the quality and craftsmanship. Um, you referenced Saddleback Leather, and um, we feel that you're incredibly marketable. And so to partner with somebody, and you think about some of this investment money that's coming in and other strategic partners, partner with somebody who can really bring you to life, a great videographer, some great social media marketing folks, um, for you to tell your story and then also talk about the love that you put into this product, people will absolutely eat up. And I think you've got a, a, a world of opportunity and direct to consumer. So um, that was a bit of our advice. So congratulations, great job. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the second runner-up, um, we felt that there was really fantastic intellectual property. Um, as we all know, everybody is sitting, holding, using a smart technology, um, and it's taken over our lives. And we felt that uh, really pushing sort of innovation and solutions in that smart technology space um, was something that uh, this second runner-up contestant was able to really capture, and a really different type of product. 
Um, we also feel that this has really good global applications. So to take this and to sell it in a lot of markets, and I also think it has a lot of other product iterations. So as smart technology continues to change, um, to take this device and to change it as well, or add a product collection that really rounds out the family. So um, Karsten with Drop It, we think, great job. Karsten, what did you say your mom said to you in fourth grade? You mentioned that? Uh, it was actually what I told my fourth grade teacher. Oh, sorry, okay. I was gonna invent the first pair of shoes that could let you walk on water. That's great. I told my mom in fifth grade that I would work for Nike someday, and I grew up in a town in Wyoming that's about this big. So follow your dreams. This is a great example of, of that, so great job. So the winner for us today um, was something that I think is just really quite unexpected and um, also in an area that none of us are necessarily experts in, which I think was also the allure and the intrigue for us. Um, what this brand and this business was able to sort of accomplish um, is job creation, is in helping fuel an economy, which is in giving back. Um, there was a clear sort of void in the market and also not a lot of competition specifically in this space. And um, we really felt that Abel was um, a great presenter as well and very passionate about taking something back to his, um, to his country. And so Propia Mixa um, was our number one winner. Yeah, so um, fantastic job by everybody again. Um, we would love to share a bunch more. I think for all of you, don't give up because if we could have picked 15, there were definitely reasons for everybody who presented today to continue to push what you're doing. Um, so it was, again, a super difficult uh, choice for us, but I think, uh, again, let's chat in the back. We'll offer um, some thoughts and feedback, but I think there are some other really great opportunities uh, that were presented in this room today. So don't give up by any means, and thank you for having us. Okay, everybody, and before we depart here, please let's, let's not forget to give a huge hand to our judges today for all the work that they brought. And that's a wrap. Thank you, everybody.